What's up guys, Sagi here and welcome to another Tech Gear Talk. Today we're going to talk about traditional adapters versus speed boosters, what each one of them does and when you'll want to use one over the other. I know this topic is confusing to a lot of people because I get this question pretty much on a daily basis. And I can see why because technically they're both types of adapters. So there are some things that they both do. But at the same time, there are two major differences. One of the biggest problems is that I hear advice where someone will say adapters are better than speed boosters. And then other people will say, no, speed boosters are better than adapters. Like there's some sort of global rule. The truth is that neither is accurate. There are times when using an adapter is the better option. And there are times when using a speed booster is a better choice. And if you use either one in the wrong situation, you can actually hurt your content. So let's get to it. I want to start out talking about traditional adapters because they're a lot simpler to understand. The one I use on my M50 and M6 Mark II is the official one from Canon, but there are less expensive third party options. This adapter simply allows me to mount EF and EFS lenses designed for DSLR on my EFM cameras like the M50 and M6 Mark II. That's it. You can see that there is not much to it. There are no optical elements or anything. It's essentially a spacer that also maintains all of the contact points for the lens so that it can communicate with the camera. And that's why things like autofocus and aperture control still work perfectly. So like I said, the first and most obvious function of the adapter is to allow for lenses designed for larger mounts to physically attach to the smaller EFM mount. So you can see that the front of the adapter is a lot larger than the back. The reason why I called it a spacer is that EF lenses, which are designed for full frame sensors and EFS lenses designed for APS-C sensors are constructed in a way that allows them to focus when they're at a certain distance from the sensor. And because both types of lenses were designed for DSLRs, they expect to sit in front of a mirror. And if you're not familiar with the difference between DSLR and mirrorless cameras, it's basically that the DSLR has a mirror that's sitting right in front of the sensor. And that mirror redirects the image that's coming through the lens up through the camera body. It then hits a couple more mirrors and then ultimately gets redirected out through the optical viewfinder so that you can see it. And the mirror itself takes up a lot of space because it's sitting at an angle in front of the sensor. And what ends up happening is that you need to design the lens in a way that it can focus on the sensor from that longer distance. On a mirrorless camera like the M50, obviously there's no mirror, that's why it's called mirrorless and the sensor is much closer to the mount. So the second function of the adapter is to add just the right amount of space between the sensor and the lens to allow it to focus properly. Now a good adapter should have no impact on image quality since there are no optical elements at all and it's just placing the lens at the proper distance from the sensor and the adapters can be used on full frame and APS-C mirrorless cameras. Like I said in the beginning, adapters are pretty straightforward, so let's get to crop factor and then to speed boosters. Before I move on, if you like what you've seen so far and have gotten value from this video, let me know by giving it a thumbs up. It helps the video and the channel and it lets me know what kind of content you like so that I can make more of it. And if it's your first time here, hit the subscribe and notification buttons so you can stay up to date on all the latest gear and tutorials. All right, so now to crop factor, and this is another topic that many people find confusing. So let's start out by defining a couple of extremely important terms, and then we'll dispel a few myths that contribute to all the confusion. First, let's talk about focal length. Now, without getting into a lot of physics, it's a measurement of the distance from the optical center of the lens to the image plane in the camera, which in our case is the digital sensor, and then back in the days was the film plate. And this measurement is made when the lens is focused to infinity. So for example, this EF mount 50 millimeter F 1.8 lens, when it's focused to infinity, the distance between the optical center of the lens and the sensor is 50 millimeters. When a 100 millimeter lens is focused to infinity, the distance between the optical center of that lens and the sensor is 100 millimeters. And remember that I earlier mentioned that these lenses are designed to focus when mounted at a specific distance from the sensor, which is why we need the adapter when using them on mirrorless cameras. The second term I wanna define is aperture. An aperture is the size of the opening in your lens. Now your lenses have a diaphragm that's made of overlapping blades and it can be adjusted to vary the size of the opening. So you can open this diaphragm and have a very large opening or aperture, which will let in a lot of light, and then you can close the aperture or make it smaller and then restrict the amount of light that's passing through the lens. In photography or video, we reference aperture as f-stop or f-number, which is actually the focal length 
divided by the diameter of the entrance pupil. Now the entrance pupil is the aperture when viewed through the front of the lens. And that's different than the actual aperture because there are optical elements in the way. And I'll show that to you with a super old manual Tamron 70 to 210. When I set it to 70 millimeters F8, you can see the size of the effective aperture. Now when I zoom in to 210, the effective aperture looks a lot bigger. Then again, smaller at 70 and again, larger at 210. This is simply the result of moving the optical elements in the lens. Now let's look at the exit pupil, which is looking through the back of the lens. Here you'll see that as I zoom in and out, the actual aperture is staying the exact same size. Now you can measure the entrance pupil by taking a set of calipers and holding it up to the front of the lens, but please don't because you'll probably scratch your lens. The equation used to get the F number or N is N equals F divided by D where again, N is the F number, F is the focal length, and D is the diameter of the entrance pupil. On this 50 millimeter lens, for example, if we opened up the aperture until it measured 25 millimeters in diameter, when we look through the front of the lens, it will give us 50 millimeters divided by 25 millimeters equals two. And we represent this as F2 with F being the focal length of the lens. When we talk about using our cameras, we say something like I used F2 for this picture or for shooting this clip. What we're actually saying is that a 50 millimeter lens set to F2 has a 50 millimeters divided by two or a 25 millimeter effective aperture. Now saying F2 makes a lot more sense than using the diameter of the entrance pupil because the lenses don't show us that value and they do show us focal length and f-stop values. It also helps explain why a smaller f number represents a larger entrance pupil. When people learn about exposure, it's sometimes confusing to wrap their head around why a smaller number would mean a larger opening. But when you realize that it's the denominator in a fraction, you see that a 50 millimeter lens set to f4 means 50 divided by four. And that's an entrance pupil of 12.5 millimeters. At F2, we're getting 50 divided by two, which is a much larger entrance pupil of 25 millimeters. All right, so let's move on to the myths about crop factor. Number one, contrary to what you may have heard, crop factor does not change the focal length of the lens. And number two, crop factor does not change the aperture of the lens. So what is crop factor? Why do we need it? And how do we use it? Crop factor is a measurement of equivalency. And in order to use it, we need to have a base reference. Now back in the day, by far the most popular cameras for photography were known as 35 millimeter cameras because they used film with a width of 35 millimeters. This is the actual width of the film strip, not just the image area of the film, which is 36 millimeters by 24 millimeters. And remember that number because we're gonna come back to it. Because 35 millimeter cameras became pretty much universal, the field of view provided by each focal length also became common knowledge. So people knew what a 24 millimeter lens looked like or a 50 millimeter or an 85 millimeter because they all gave the same field of view on every 35 millimeter camera. That's also why 35 millimeters became the standard or base we use with crop factor when describing field of view or angle of view. When digital cameras came along, everything changed because in the beginning, most sensors were smaller than 35 millimeter film and the images using the same typical focal lengths didn't look the same. They no longer had the field of view that people were used to. It became much more zoomed in because we changed the effective field of view. But what is that and why did it change? Before we get to that, let's quickly discuss full frame sensor cameras. A full frame sensor is the same size as the image area on 35 millimeter film, 36 millimeters by 24 millimeters. That's why the terms full frame equivalent or 35 millimeter equivalent are interchangeable. Because this is the base for our system, a full frame sensor still has a crop factor of one. But since 50 millimeter times one still equals 50 millimeter, there's no change to the effective field of view. And a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame sensor camera will give us the same field of view as it would on a 35 millimeter camera. Now let's see how crop factor works. So a round lens produces a circular image, but the sensor on the camera is rectangular. So what we're doing is capturing a rectangular portion of the projected image circle. As you would expect, a full frame sensor captures an area that's 36 millimeter times 24 millimeters from the projected image circle. An APS-C sensor from every brand other than Canon has a size of 23.5 millimeters 
times 15.6 millimeters, meaning that it's capturing a smaller portion of that same image circle. But how much smaller? Well, you probably guessed it, but this is where we use the crop factor. So the crop factor is actually a measurement of the ratio of the diagonal of each sensor size. So starting out with a full frame sensor, which we know is 36 by 24 millimeters, to get the diagonal, we use the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared, or 36 squared plus 24 squared equals C squared, which ends up being 1296 plus 576, which is 1872. We then take the square root of 1872 and we get 43.3 millimeters. So that's the length of the diagonal on a full frame sensor. Looking at APS-C, we get 32.5 squared plus 15.6 squared, which is 552.25 plus 342.36, which is 795.61. We take the square root of 795.61 and we get 28.2 millimeters. Then to figure out the crop factor of an APS-C sensor, we take the diagonal of the full frame sensor, 43.3, divided by the diagonal of an APS-C sensor, 28.2, and we get 1.52 or 1.5 crop. On a micro four third sensor, we get 17 square plus 13 square, which is 289 plus 169 equals 458. The square root of 458 is 21.4. When we then take 43.3 divided by 21.4, we get 2.02 .02 or a 2.0 crop factor. And if you need to review the math, go ahead and watch that section one more time. Now going back to effective field of view, when people say that a 50 millimeter lens on an APS-C sensor is a 75 millimeter lens, what they mean is that a 50 millimeter lens on an APS-C sensor gives you the same effective field of view as a 75 millimeter lens would on a full frame sensor. But I wanna differentiate that from the lens actually turning into a 75 millimeter lens. It doesn't. It's the same 50 millimeter lens, still designed to focus with its optical center being 50 millimeters away from the sensor. So remember that the crop factor does not change the focal length of the lens, it's changing the effective field of view we get when we're using this lens on a sensor other than a full frame sensor. Now let's get back to aperture. Again, the size of the opening of the lens doesn't change based on how big the sensor is. Going back to our previous example, if we use a 50 millimeter lens at f2, that means that the size of the entrance pupil is 25 millimeters. That size doesn't change based on what sensor I put behind the lens. The entrance pupil is 25 millimeters if it sits in front of a full frame sensor, APS-C, or micro four third sensor. It lets in the exact same amount of light and produces the same image circle. We're simply capturing a smaller portion of the image circle with a smaller sensor. Now lenses designed for full frame sensor cameras project an image circle that's large enough to cover a full frame sensor. Lenses designed for APS-C sensors only project an image circle that's large enough to cover the smaller APS-C sensor. So if you mounted one of these on a full frame sensor camera, you'd actually see the edges of the lens. And always remember that crop factor is a reference of equivalency and it's a function of the sensor size, not the lens design. So when using an APS-C sensor camera with a crop factor of 1.5, you apply this crop factor to every lens, whether it was designed for full frame or APS-C sensor cameras. Two 50 millimeter lenses, one designed for full frame sensor and another one designed for APS-C sensor, will give you the same angle of view, 75 millimeter full frame equivalent, when used with an APS-C sensor camera. The lens designed for an APS-C sensor simply never projected an image circle that's large enough to cover a full frame sensor. But the crop factor is still a representation of the full frame equivalent field of view. I wanna mention one more thing that you may have heard because I know I'll get questions about it and I'll actually publish a full video just about crop factor. When people say that you need to multiply the aperture when applying a crop factor, it depends on what you're trying to do. Get the same exposure or get the same depth of field. You will get the same exposure even if you don't multiply the aperture because a 24 millimeter at f2.8 will be just as bright as a 70 millimeter at f2.8. And if you're wondering how that could be since you're narrowing the angle of view by so much, it's because even though the f-stop is 2.8 at 24 and at 70, 
the entrance pupil at 70 millimeters will be a lot larger. At 24 millimeter f2.8, the entrance pupil is 24 millimeters divided by 2.8 or 8.57 millimeters. At 70 millimeters f2.8, the entrance pupil is 70 millimeters divided by 2.8 or 25 millimeters. You can see that if I set this 24 to 70 f2.8 lens to 2.8 and then remove it from the camera, so it's stuck at f2.8, when I zoom out to 24, the entrance pupil looks smaller. When I zoom into 70, it looks a lot bigger even though the actual aperture is the exact same size. This is again because I'm shifting the optical elements in the lens when I zoom in and out, and therefore the magnification of the opening changes. So when people say you need to multiply the aperture by the crop factor, that's only in the case that you're trying to match the exact same look in terms of depth of field, not in terms of exposure. And like I said, I'll do a complete video about this. So if you're watching and this other video is already published, you'll see it up in the corner and in the description. Otherwise, if you think this is interesting and want to learn more, hit the subscribe and notification buttons. Make sure that you have notifications turned to all so you actually get notified when I publish it. All right, now we're ready to talk about speed boosters and then I'll get to when you should use a speed booster versus an adapter. So a speed booster is like an adapter in that it still allows you to attach larger mount lenses to smaller mount cameras. So it still lets us use EF lenses designed for full frame DSLRs on mirrorless APS-C and micro four third cameras. But in addition to that, it incorporates an optical element that does a few things. First, it's a focal length reducer. So it's using an optical element to resize the larger image circle projected by a full frame sensor lens to better fit the size of sensor that the speed booster was designed for. And depending on which one you're using, you'll get a different multiplier. So for example, using a 50 millimeter lens, using a speed booster with a 0.7 multiplier on an APS-C sensor, you're getting 50 millimeters times 0.7, which is 35 millimeters. You'll then take the 35 millimeters and multiply by the crop factor of the APS-C sensor, 1.5, to get 52.5 equivalent field of view. This doesn't completely eliminate the APS-C crop, but it is pretty close. Now, the other advantage is that you're now taking all of that unused light, which wasn't being captured, and are effectively condensing it onto the sensor, resulting in a brighter image. And if we need math to support this, then what we're actually doing here is the exact opposite of what a teleconverter does. A teleconverter, which increases the effective focal length by a factor of two, also reduces the amount of light by a factor of two. With the speed booster, we're effectively reducing the focal length by a factor of 0.7. But the entrance pupil remains the same size because the speed booster is placed behind the lens. So it still looks the same size when looking through the front of the lens. So 50 millimeter at f2.8 has an entrance pupil of 50 divided by 2.8 or 17.86 millimeters. If we multiply the 50 by 0.7, we get 35 millimeters. Using the same diameter of 17.86, we get 35 millimeters divided by 17.86, which gives us 1.96, which we round up to F2. When we multiply this by the crop factor of an APS-C sensor, the 35 millimeter will give us 52.5 millimeter equivalent field of view, but the aperture remains at F2 for exposure. If we're trying to get the same look in terms of depth of field on a full frame sensor, then we'll have to multiply that by 1.5 and then also adjust our ISO to get the proper exposure. And this is actually easier to understand when you're moving from APS-C to full frame than the other way around. And I'll explain it in a much more detailed follow-up video about crop factor. So we're getting a wider angle of view and an additional stop of light. So it sounds perfect, right? Well, it's very good, but it's not quite perfect. First, we're adding an optical element. So some reduction in image quality is unavoidable. Whether this matters enough for what most people do will depend on the speed booster that you're using and the user's expectations. For the most part, this isn't something that has ever stopped me from using them. Another issue is that autofocus is not as fast or accurate as with an adapter. Again, whether this is a deal breaker for you depends on the quality of the speed booster, your particular use and expectations. Clearly, many people use them, so the delta in performance is acceptable for most users. The last caveat that I wanna mention is that depending on your speed booster, some more advanced functions, for example, image stabilization, may not work or not work as well. So which is better, the adapter or the speed booster? 
Well, that depends on your goals. If you're simply trying to attach lenses designed for DSLRs on mirrorless cameras, then the adapter is your best bet. You'll get the same field of view and performance you got on a DSLR, and the image quality will be as good as that lens can produce. If, on the other hand, you need a wider angle of view, better low light performance, and the slight loss in image quality plus the other potential issues that I mentioned are acceptable to you, then you'll want to get a speed booster. I have both because I think both have their upsides. I like the adapter because I can use all my L-series glass on my two APS-C mirrorless cameras, and I like the speed booster for when I want to push the envelope even more, or when I was using less expensive glass and was trying to make those slower lenses wider and better in low light. Having both an adapter and a speed booster also means you can get two effective focal lengths for every prime lens that you own. For example, I can use the 50 millimeter with an adapter and get an effective focal length of 50 millimeters because Canon APS-C sensors have a crop factor of 1.6. I can then use it on a speed booster and get an effective focal length of 56 millimeters. So it's almost like having two primes. And I can do the same thing with my 100 millimeter lens. So again, I definitely see an advantage to having both. But now I'm curious to know what you think. Which one are you planning to buy or maybe even both? And what lenses are you planning to use? I'll put links in the description to some of my favorite adapters and speed boosters so you can find something that works for your budget. I really hope that I was able to give you a good overview of the differences between adapters and speed boosters. If I did, please let me know by giving this video a thumbs up tweet it, share it, and if you haven't yet, join the community by hitting the subscribe and notification buttons. You can always find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Tech Gear Talk. And you know what I always say, buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon.